Hi everyone, it's Jerry. This is game four from the 2012 FIDE World Chess Championship match. Going into this round, both players have one and a half points each, and Gelfand on the white end in this game opens with d4, a non-replying d5, and the first nine moves of this game are identical to game two. And so I'm just gonna kind of fast forward to that point. And if you're curious about uh, uh, some more specifics about uh, each of the moves that you're seeing me play through right now, I've included a link to a video playlist in the description to this video, uh, a video that's initially been uploaded to youtube.com slash chess network. So after this move, bishop to d6, in game two, we saw rook to c1, this move 10, rook to c1. But in this game four, we're having queen to c2 instead, and we'll see why this plays a role in, uh, or excuse me, how this is different uh, than rook to c1 when it comes time for black to make a decision in the center of the board with a particular pawn capture. Uh, but before we get to that uh, change in the center, we're still having uh, the same moves played on the black side. Whether it's uh, rook to c1 or queen to c2 on move 10, black is playing the same thing, namely e5. After c takes d, c takes d, now we have e4. Again, everything is still the same as in game two. If you could just visualize rook on c1 and a queen still on her home square, the same action is going on in the center of the board. In that game two, again, trying to visualize these pieces, on different squares with these uh, next lines that I show. In that game two, we saw d takes e, knight takes e, knight takes knight, bishop takes knight, followed by a knight to f6 move. This would be a mistake running with knight to f6 here because the queen being on c2 is actually watching over that bishop. And so white could just be winning a pawn in the following way. So we're not going to have that type of. Uh, move played. We could still enter this particular line, but knight f6 is uh, faulty. Instead, something like h6 would be played. Soon enough, these guys will be exchanged. And I think um, black is maybe uh, doing well to avoid this type of pawn uh, capture in the center, because to make a move like h6 at a moment where the position has clearly opened up quite a, quite a bit, and white is you know, fully developed right here with a direct connection between the rooks and, you know, these queenside pieces still not uh, out and about and this knight still needing to move before uh, those queenside pieces could come out. This is a little bit, you know, a little bit shaky right here. So uh, apparently seeing a, a better way to obtain equality on the black end, uh, we're not having d takes e, in other words, we're having uh, e takes d, and not the immediate recapture of this pawn either. Uh, keep in mind that going with knight takes uh, immediately, you know, does subject yourself to uh, possible tactics on h2, the knight no longer on f3. You need to be on the lookout for these possibilities. Additionally, seeing how the knight on d4 is now unprotected, you set yourself up for tactics. So these are maybe a couple of reasons to not run with this particular recapture on d4, but um, w instead what was played in the game, knight on c3 captures d5. After knight takes knight, pawn takes knight, knight to f6, this is the best way to meet the threat now on h7. Uh, just get that uh, knight to f6 and allow for the bishop to come out. h3 at this point is aimed at uh, restricting this bishop, so you don't have to deal with uh, an annoying um, pressure point on f3. Bishop to d7, what else is there? There's no other uh, square for that guy, so, and uh, the rook wants to uh, contribute in some way. So rook to d1, uh, it's important not to get caught up with uh, just, you know, placing a rook on an open file. Does it really matter? Do you play your, your rook to d1 or your rook to e1? It does, because you don't want this to happen. You don't want it to be a case where after rook e1, rook c8, and your queen has to interfere with your rooks. You don't want your queen in between those guys. So instead, we have rook to d1, and should rook to c8 be played, the queen bumps back. Soon enough, that happens. But first, rook, rook to e8, knight takes on d, rook c8, queen b1, and now h6. There's no need to go for an immediate recapture on d5. 
that would just hang the h7 pawn. It's going nowhere. Uh, so we have first knight f5 and the first real uh, imbalance in this game because when you look at the pawn structure, there's no no uh, imbalance going on with the pawn structure. Two on two, three on three, and uh, after this exchange, bishop takes knight, bishop takes bishop, we have uh, the bishop pair versus a, a bishop and knight situation going on. Uh, really, you have to just get rid of this guy. He's a giant pest for as long as he's on the f5 square, so just get rid of him. Bishop takes, bishop takes, and now just meeting the threat on the rook, rook bumps up to now c5. Um, if you're wondering about why maybe white didn't, uh, instead of the knight to f5 move, why maybe bishop c4 isn't played, well, you could always, this isn't necessarily the best, but you know, you could just kick it away and then grab on d5. So knight f5 instead, bishop takes, bishop takes, rook c5, the pawn now hit twice, defended zero, and it's going to fall soon enough and the material is going to be restored. So really the last thing that black is needing to do in such a situation, seeing how white has the bishop pair, you just want to exchange off a pair of bishops. You want to exchange off, in this case, the dark square bishops so that you can then rely upon a particular color complex for the remainder of your pieces. Uh, you'd like to uh, be able to, in this case, um, move about on dark squares once those dark square bishops are off the board. That way this guy is not going to uh, bother you in any way. So after that's rook c5 move, rook to e1, getting all the pieces involved, rook takes d, there's no way to save that guy anyhow. Bishop c3, and the, if there's one word that kind of comes to mind uh, in, in these sorts of positions, it's just repositioning, looking for better squares for pieces. And that's what we have. Bishop to c3, getting on a better diagonal. The rooks come off, or a pair of rooks come off. Bishop c5, a better diagonal. Queen c2, a better square, uh, getting on an open file. And finally, we're going to have these uh, dark square bishops come off. There's not a better diagonal for this bishop. Having these guys come off is very likely. That's what occurs. Queen c8, welcoming queen takes queen. If this does occur, this could be a bit annoying since this bishop is now observing two pawns that are on light squares. But black recognizing this is just trying to kick this bishop away first with g6. Uh, white is just uh, being persistent on this diagonal with bishop g4, but black is just as persistent with kicking it off with h5. And now we have queen exchange, a rook recapture, bishop to f3, hitting b7, and also boxing out this knight. We'll see this in a couple instances in this endgame. Uh, a bishop and knight lined on the same, or excuse me, on the same file, exactly two squares separating them, are really just fighting for these same advancing squares. They kind of negate one another. They offset one another. So b6 meets the threat on the b7 pawn. Rook c1 is looking to place the rook on the sixth rank. The sixth rank is the more valuable in this situation, seeing how there's a few pieces on that rank. But it's just defended with rook d6. King, king improvement for white. Placing another pawn on a dark square so that this guy isn't going to get it anytime soon. King e2, more king position going on. Knight d5, observing that f4 square, and it's just met right away with g3. And I guess there is uh, the possibility for a bishop for knight exchange, and then a rook coming down to c6. If this does happen, I believe we would see something like b5. And if the rook goes after the a5 pawn, b4, the rook is doing a good job adding uh, defense to that a pawn. And uh, this rook has a lot of lateral movement. It could uh, start to come to any one of these squares and put pressure on these pawns, maybe even play a move like h4, and then really uh, a threat of playing that rook to this uh, g5 square and hitting at g2 could be very annoying. Uh, improvements for the king are found by just you know bumping it up to uh, g7, maybe getting this f pawn involved as well and advancing these uh, king side pawns. Again, I think everything is quite all right in such a situation as, as this one right here with this rook uh, doing a good job on the uh, fifth rank. Uh, we don't enter that. We don't. We're not having bishop takes knight in that case. Instead, it's just g3, a preventative against knight f4. Knight e7, 
is looking to reposition by way of f5, and then it could be quite annoying on d4, but white has none of it, and just once again boxes it out um, and uh, you know stops knight to f5 stuff. After bishop e4, one last uh, improvement for black, getting the king involved on that g7 square, looking to you know get into this e6 square, or excuse me, f6 and then e6. There's really nothing more to do. Both players are, uh, you know, have have their pieces on their on their best squares, and this is a, a dead equal end game, and it should be no surprise. Both players, uh, once again in this game for now, uh, shake hands. So uh, that's all for this video. Uh, as always, I hope you got something out of it. Take care. Bye.